Hi guys, uh, we are going to do a grand ward round. Um, at this present, we are in discussion about a um, patient who has presented with uh, acute myocardial infarction anterior, uh, proven on ECG. The patient has uh, heart failure and the patient has also cardiogenic shock. Uh, we are now in discussion on how to treat this patient and um, what are the monitorings that we need to do. So um, we will now go on. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about antiplatelets, and there's no, no, uh, nothing that um, we don't know. All platelets, uh, all patients undergoing uh, primary PCI should have dual antiplatelet therapy. Aspirin should be given orally, and um, should be given a loading dose of three hundred milligram stat then about 150 milligram daily. You can go down to 75 milligram. Propidogrel is highly effective, but it is a pro-drug. It takes a few hours to reach therapeutic level. And uh, currently, I think the therapy of choice is actually uh, a new generation of drug, which is um, P2, 12, Y12 receptor inhibitor. Um, is Tigacrolol. And the PLATO study actually showed that Tigacrolol is superior to well, And the duration of treatment is actually dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. These are how about patients who do not go for uh, angioplasty? They are just treated with thrombolytic. You still give them dual antiplatelet therapy? Uh, no, I usually give them only aspirin. And then... You the only yeah, and then the, when when they plan for angioplasty uh, after the thrombolysis, then I would give them dual antiplatelet. I think there were enough studies to show that dual antiplatelet therapy is oh, better. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so we maybe will I'll look out for this um, the journal review to see this. Can we go on? There was a question about. Uh, this patient's blood pressure is low, whether you should support it with the inotropes or not. You know? uh, ah, yes, so it's part of our discussion mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. So um, we will answer that question later. So this thrombolytic fibrinolytic therapy, uh, of course, there are some absolute um, contraindication to it. Previous intracranial hemorrhage or stroke of unknown origin at any time. Um, I think if it's stroke, I think if it's more than six months, it's okay. So ischemic stroke in the last six months. Uh, central nervous system damage or neoplasm or AV, known AV malformation. Recent trauma, surgery or head injury in the last one month. Gastrointestinal bleeding within the past month. Known bleeding disorders. Okay, menses is not bleeding disorder. And this one, I got it from the American Heart Journal, <laughs> Heart Association Guideline. Aortic dissection, non-compressible puncture in the past, past 24 hours. And then, of course, we have relative uh, contraindication, that's TIA in the last six months, oral anticoagulant therapy, pregnancy, refractory hypertension, which is an applier, advanced liver, liver disease, effective endocarditis. Why cannot give um, bulletin in infective endocarditis? I never knew that. You can get uh, septic uh, arthritis and you can bleed. Yeah? Really? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Active peptic ulcer disease um, and then prolonged or traumatic resuscitation. So this patient has none of the above. Which is so this patient yes, uh, when um, this patient has got hypertension, and um, it, you have to think if this this is uh, aortic dissection as well, because you can't give thrombolytic if the patient has got aortic dissection, right? Now, um, what's interesting? But is you seldom, but you seldom get presentation of aortic dissection without high that, blood pressure. The, the, the thing about it is it would be usually it's the right coronary artery that is yes. 
that tends to dissect into, right? Secondly, um, you should try and hear for regurgitation, regurgitation murmur, as well as pericardial rub at the same time. Um, that may give you a clue that this is dissecting aneurysm as well. And obviously, you must um, look at the pulses, the peripheral pulses, whether they're equal or not. So those are clues if uh, the, per the person presents with an inferior infarct uh, and then has severe hypertension and you hear a, a recent or a new uh, regurgitation, regurgitation murmur or a pericardial rub and the pulses are not equal, then the, you really have to think about dissecting an aneurysm. And you need an X-ray and an echo before you start thrombolytics as well. But I tend to see, um, I've seen aortic dissection quite a few times, but uh, they're not common, uh, but always keep it behind you, the back of your mind. Um, but they usually have very high blood pressure and they don't usually present with cardiogenic shock. They can, okay. but, uh, uh, they can, but they can, but they can, huh? Yeah, I've seen it. They, I've seen people presenting with anterior infarcts as well, but uh, usually there are other clues to, to the dissecting aneurysm. I had a patient with chest pain with inferior MI, yeah, a lady. And then um, I went on to do an angiogram and my catheter was in the horse loom. <laughs> it was damn scary. I sent it to uh, Dato Azar. Mm. Hey, hold on. Huh? So we go on. Okay, this primary angioplasty is the choice of treatment, a choice of reperfusion if, um, if the facility is available. It's best within three hours of onset of chest pain, but it can be done even up to 12 hours. But it can it should be done only if the door to balloon time is less than 90 minutes. So as you can see here, okay, this is the left anterior descending artery, and there is an abrupt okay, uh, closure of this artery, and this is what happens after the opening up. Okay. Now, just now, okay, let's go through some of the questions that uh, some people have asked. Okay, so we have answered whether we should resuscitate the patient. There's no need to resuscitate the patient because the patient is quite, um, it's not, in, there's no need to resuscitate the patient, basically. Okay, resuscitation means that when the patient has already had a cardiac arrest, blood pressure is not powerful. Is not recordable, pulse is not palpable, patient is not conscious, then you start resuscitation. But in this case, the patient is conscious, okay, there is blood pressure, low, but there is blood pressure, okay. So, um, so just now somebody asked, okay, so how do we treat, what medication do we use for hypotension? So cardiogenic shock in acute myocardial infarction complicates about 5 to 10% of patients with acute myocardial infarction. Okay. Now they have, this is um, seen more in women than in men. Okay. Higher risk of readmission within 10 days despite treatment for AMI when the patient presents with cardiogenic shock the first time round. The pathophysiology in this kind of cases would be because of diminished cardiac output, cardiac ischemia, vasoconstriction, and even inflammation. And acute kidney failure is seen in 15 to 30 percent of patients with cardiogenic shock. So now, at this point of time, his creatinine that is high, okay, could be an acute kidney failure because of the low blood pressure. So it could be reversible. So how do we treat cardiogenic shock? Okay. Now, some people might want to give an intravenous fluid challenge, which I, I would seriously avoid in this patient. The lung is wet. Okay. 
I would try to at all costs to avoid ventilation. So if you give intravenous fluid challenge in this gentleman, chances are he will get worse. Okay, and um, we would then go on to need to ventilate him. But uh, Dr. Ahmad Niza has a point about using BiPAP. Niza, maybe you'd like to tell them what BiPAP is and how it will help. What we're introducing is actually positive airway pressure at the end of the uh, tidal volume as well to keep the airway open. And the added pressure also keeps the, uh, the fluids uh, from entering to the alveoli and therefore um, you know, allow the patient to be better oxygenated and he feels more comfortable as well. Um, the only thing about positive air pressure is his blood pressure is low. So uh, you might actually um, cause a reduction in preload as well. That is the venous return and his blood pressure may fall a little bit. So you will have to probably uh, consider a uh, vasopressor support as well at the same time. Yeah. You see, when we do this angioplasty, we need the patient to lie flat. Okay. And um, it is very difficult to do it if the patient can't lie flat, the patient's restless and in distress. Okay. Um, so we need to make him as comfortable as possible before we actually get him. Yep. So how do we actually bring up the blood pressure. Okay. First, before we speak about that, I will go on to say that I would give the patient some Lasix, um, maybe a small dose, 20 to 40 milligram, push a little bit of fluid out and make him a little bit more comfortable. IV morphine we have mentioned, okay, it will help both um, the pain and so the fluid overload. Vasopressor support. We have a few choices. We have dobutamine, we have dopamine, and we have adrenaline. Now, I would start with dobutamine. Um, Isa? I think it would be a, a, one of the choices, but uh, it might cause the blood pressure or the systolic pressure to drop further because uh, it has got some um, beta-1 effect, isn't it? It causes some vasodilatation as well which is okay. the, uh, something that you want in this situation. Since this is a, a, a pump failure, a cardiogenic shock, there is usually um, reflex uh, vasoconstriction and uh, the, it's actually detrimental in this situation. So um, if you, there is a way of actually measuring cardiac output, um, dobutamine would be a good option actually. Yeah. Um, I think they they have a vasodilatation and uh, effect only at do low doses. Uh, especially in dopamine, some people give low doses as what a renal dose. Okay, so for example, in this case, if you want to bring up the blood pressure, I would say let's say put on dobutamine, and then if you need to add on, you add on the dopamine and you add on a no add if necessary. But usually at the blood pressure of 80, 50, you revascularize, you wait for a while, the blood pressure would tend to come up in the next few days or so. But um, if you have put the patient on dobutamine and dopamine, and during the last bit of it, the blood pressure has come up and you have tailed it down and taken off your dobutamine, Sometimes you can put the patient on a low dose of dopamine just to, you know, encourage um, renal reperfusion. Um, no act can be used, but uh, the problem with using all these drugs is that that increases the risk of tachyarrhythmias. Uh, Niza? Yeah, they, they, they do increase the risk for uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, but I think the immediate issue here is trying yes. to increase the Bring. mean arterial pressure, actually. Yes. So, so I we have no choice. To get the blood, the mean arterial pressure to maybe above 65. Um, I'm not sure what his usual blood pressure is. 
um, it might be high because he's hypertensive. But yes. uh, in a normal person, I would actually target a mean arterial pressure above 65. And uh, if I can achieve that with dobutamine, I'll be happy. Yeah. Um, but there are many devices that um, can actually help increase the cardiac output. They are called mechanical circuitry support devices, and that include an intra-aortic balloon pump and an impeller. Um, I usually tend to not use these devices unless absolutely necessary. They are very costly. Um, do we have enough clinical evidence to say that they help? I think the uh, recently intra-eutic balloon pump, um, the, uh, I mean, if you look at pathophysiology, it should work. Um, there are reasons to use them because uh, what an intra-arterial balloon pump does is, um, is it actually in increases uh, diastolic blood flow through the myocardium. It also reduces peripheral vascular resistance. And uh, both are actually uh, of benefit to a person with cardiogenic shock. The only issue is if this is not a reversible condition, if this is, uh, then, then you will have difficulty because they will be dependent on the IABP actually. So, but usually with, when I mean, you do primary PCI, you insert the intra balloon pump. Um, it is probably temporary. Uh, if you can actually open the vessel up, um, you probably will not need the IABP for long. Uh, and it might yes. be beneficial. Okay. Um, and I cannot emphasize more that in patients like this, frequent monitoring is extremely, extremely important. Okay. Sometimes... In this kind of patients, I call up regularly, check on the blood pressure and the urine up. And sometimes I truly celebrate when there is a really good urine up. Uh, more so than the blood pressure, I'm always more worried about the urine output. Things turn around once the urine output comes out and then you know your patient is going to get better. Do you get that feeling? Yeah, obviously, because if the urine output is there, then cardiac output is improved as well, isn't it? Yes, this is very important. Okay, we will answer the questions later. Okay, so now as we know, in this patient, he has not just acute myocardial infarction, he has cardiogenic shock, he's in heart failure, he has acute kidney failure, okay? And we know, we need to know what is we know he has multiple risk factors. How do we score them? We use a TME risk score. So he is young, so age older than 75 is three points. He's not even 65 and above. Okay, he has diabetes, he's hypertension, that's one point each. Uh, he had no history of angina. He has a systolic blood pressure of less than 100, so three points. Okay. Heart rate is high, so two points. And then he is in Kilip 2, maybe even 3, right? Okay, body weight, we, yeah, we don't have any, any um, anything to say what is his body weight. Now, this is important, okay, in knowing the outcome of the patient. But more importantly, okay, he is a diabetic patient. And diabetic patients in acute myocardial infarction, um, it is more difficult even to diagnose because they are known to have atypical presentation, epigastric pain, profuse sweating, no chest pain, silent infarct. Okay? They usually have more severe diffuse atherosclerosis. Okay? Um, and in diabetic patients, the use of more potent antiplatelets like Prasugrel and Tigacrolol is definitely beneficial, more beneficial than Propitogrel that has been given in studies. And try to optimize your glucose management to below 11.1 millimole, but at the same time, you need to avoid hypoglycemia. 
So the quest comes to the question somebody asked. Okay. Uh, there is one. How frequent do we monitor sugar level? I still would monitor sugar level maybe three times a day or every six hourly initially. Uh, I would put this patient on short acting uh, insulin, bring down the sugar, and then um, maybe titrate your um, insulin level, your insulin um, according a chart, a scale, okay, uh, so that he would not be hypoglycemic, okay. Um, it is not um, advisable to give for large doses. I'm not very keen on um, infusion of um, insulin most times because this is not a diabetic emergency. Uh, Nisa? Yeah, I think sufficient just to give subcutaneous. Uh, yeah. So TDS of six hourly uh, uh, sugar monitoring, Arifa. Okay. So long term therapy. What kind of long term therapy do we advise the patient? Of course, lifestyle mod modification and risk factors control. It is very important to advise them to stop smoking. Um, they are more likely to listen to us when they have come in with acute myocardial infarction. They are more likely to listen to us because we are doctors, which is true, um, more than their spouse. Okay, uh, Counseling and adherence to medical therapy. We need not only the patient, the, we also need to accept that the patient will eventually need polypharmacy because we will then need to add on medication to improve this LV function. Okay. What are the medications that we need to add on to improve the LV function before he goes home if if the blood pressure permits anyone? No? Okay. Basically to treat him as he goes home uh, we need to think of ACE inhibitor, beta blockers, spironolactone, okay. and also, uh, of course, very important, a statin. Um, Isa, mm -hmm. how about the use of the newer hypoglycemic agents? Not just for diabetes, for, but heart, for heart failure. Have you used yeah. them? I, I've or, used um particularly the SGLT2 inhibitors um, are probably something that I would consider in people with impaired LV function and diabetes. Even people without uh, uh, diabetes, uh, they, are, they seem to... Yes, be they are already... Uh, I think FDA has approved in their guidelines uh, yeah. in, and some people have added, added in the guidelines to add this um, newer hypoglycemic drugs for patients with uh, heart failure, even if they are not diabetic. I'm not sure how it works though. Okay. Now, before I go to case two, okay, uh, we take some questions here. They won't feel pain. Oh, yes, it is not uncommon for diabetic patients not to feel any chest pain. Because just like they have neuropathy to the nerve endings of their peripheries, uh, they also have neuropathy that causes them to have silent MI and pain that are very atypical or no pain at all. Usually you'd expect uh, that in long-standing diabetics, right? Uh, if they're new diabetics, then I don't expect that. They should feel yes. pain. Yeah. Yes. Like sometimes when they have uh, diabetes for 20, 30 years. Yeah. So the elderly um, people with long-standing diabetes are more likely to have such things. Okay. Tian Sheng said, if a patient could not specify the exact time of the onset of the chest pain, how do we gauge whether thrombolysis is still safe uh, if we are able to transfer the patient to a PCI center within two hours? 
Now, it is unlikely that you can feel pain and you cannot tell when is the onset of the pain. That's one. Two is, look at the ECG. If the ECG, the ST segment is still very high, chances is an acute phase. Okay. Um, if not, it will have formed Q waves. If you don't see a Q wave uh, on the ECG, then chances are that he's still in acute phase. And uh, within 12 hours, I would still thrombolize the patient. There's no complication. Nisa? Um, if they have continuing chest pains and the ECG still shows ST elevation, um, you can still consider uh, thrombolytics. And in some, in some situation, if it's possible, even primary PCI. Now, may I ask what's the usual dose for bolus insulin? Okay, this bolus insulin, um, we're not, we don't give it IV, we give it subcut. So subcutaneous. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about bolus IV insulin. Um, it's not necessary in this case. Usually I will start, let's say if it's 17, um, maybe 8 to 12 units of uh, humane arm, atropid, depending on what is available in the center. Uh, and then I'll watch the next few uh, sugar level and then decide on something more definite in few days. Sometimes the acute... Um, Acute episode of let's say all this MI can also bring down the bring up the sugar quite easily. So any kind of form of physical stress can also cause the sugar to be increased. And then somebody said, Hi, good evening, Dr. Betty. What is your opinion of a young patient? Okay, so this one we will talk about it later. We are going to discuss this case first. And no article asks, what are the other take-home medications for patients with AMI besides antihypertensive medications? So first, uh, of course, your antiplatelet, because you have just done uh, the angioplasty, uh, I would definitely put him on a statin. I would put him go home with the hypoglycemic drug. The first choice is still metformin. Maybe... Uh, Maybe if the sugar is, I mean, the creatinine is not coming down after the blood pressure is controlled, then you would consider other form of um, other form of um, hypoglycemic drugs, okay? And then you would definitely need patients to be on medication, not just for the hypertension, but also for the heart failure. So for the heart failure. You need a patient to be on ACE inhibitor. You need the patient to be on a beta blocker. And then you need the patient to be on spironolactone. Uh, what else is there, Nisa? Uh, you would be, if possible, on a Coralan. Um, you high with the beta blockers, yeah. I would consider Coralan. Coralan. Um, have we missed out anything? I think that is about it. So, and definitely, please remember statin, huh? my favorite drug. Okay, so we go on. Um, go on Betty, to the next case, yeah. Betty. Yes. Uh, Betty. Uh, yes. My original question. Yes. About the uh, primary angioplasty. Uh, yes. So, uh, if a uh, patient present uh, after 12 hours, uh, why primary angio is not uh, beneficial? Okay. Um, you see, as when the blood vessel, the artery is occluded, okay, I think within an hour or two, okay, 20 to 30% of the muscle would die. And after three hours, half of it. After 12 hours, okay, it would not be called res, uh, primary PTCA anymore. Because basically, um, the myocardium would all be dead. So there is nothing much to rescue anymore. 
So there is um, no no rush in that sense anymore. So all reperfusion therapy should be before 12 hours to save any myocardium. Uh, does that, do you get yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. trying to say? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So now you get it. Huh? So we go to the second case. Okay. Okay, this is a 42-year-old gentleman, and these are all young gentlemen because we are actually seeing more and uh, younger and younger patients. And this patient has chest pain for one hour, severe crushing in nature, no sweating. He has no history of diabetes or hypertension, but he is a smoke. He is active. He exercises three times a week. And the signs are, he's fairly comfortable, but blood pressure is low, 80 over 40. JVP is not raised, lungs clear, there's no murmur and there's no anchor edema. And this is the ECG. Uh, anyone? Uh, can anyone tell me what's the diagnosis? Or what do you actually see on this ECG? Nobody? ST elevation. Yes, ST elevation. Very good. Did V1, V2, V3, one and eight. Yes. yes. So what is your diagnosis? Inferior and anterior septal yes. MI Harry said. Okay. Now this is a typical ECG okay, of an inferior MI. Okay. But what he has on top of that is actually a right-sided infarct. So, and that is why the blood pressure is low, 80 over 40. Now, I wanted to present this case to demonstrate to you okay, how two different, one disease, but just at the side of presentation means an anterior MI and a, an inferior MI both presenting with hypotension. I wanted to demonstrate one is because of cardiogenic shock okay and one is because of right-sided failure okay so there is a decreased right heart function which will lead to reduced LV preload and cardiac output. And this will cause systemic hypotension. So in this case, I want to demonstrate that in this case where you have hypotension with an inferior MI and maybe possibly a right-sided infarct, you want to give fluid challenge because this patient has no clinical signs or symptoms of heart failure. And in this patient, you would run 500 ml of crystallite or normal saline and, and you will find the blood pressure improving as you run fluid. Okay, And then you monitor closely. Okay, And in this kind of patient, treatment with nitrate may be harmful because it may bring down the blood pressure. Of course, the so, of course, in this case, we won't discuss further about uh, the antiplatelet therapy, the primary PTCA, because it is the same. Okay, The steps that we take is the same. But what I would like to demonstrate to you is how one case I would not give fluid challenge, and in one case, I will not hesitate to give fluid challenge. Lisa, where are you? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> You, you need to give fluid challenge in this um, because it's a preload problem. Yes. So this is a very interesting. So I want to go through again uh, a few ECGs okay, and a few problems in diagnosing um, MI. And one is actually chest pain with left rundle branch block. Um, Isa? Mm-hmm. So, 
in patients with chest pain, and if especially if the patient just came to you, and the first ECG that you see is the left rundle branch block, do you decide to treat it as an MI or not? If it's a new left bundle branch block, yes, um, you would consider that as an MI actually, especially with the chest pain. Actually, through the yes, uh, especially with the chest pain. But they found that in um, in an article that I read that only eight percent chest pain with what seems to be a new left bundle branch block turn out to be. AMI, but I think I would treat as an AMI. Okay, this is an inferior MI with posterior myocardial infarction. Um, so typically, ST elevation over the inferior lid, which is 2, 3, and AVF, and ST depression for V1 and V2. Okay. Sorry, uh, let me some. Sorry, uh, can I? Uh, okay. So, in this case, okay, this just now was inferior with posterior MI because you see an ST depression in V1, V2. And this is a true posterior MI with ST depression in V1, V2, and, uh, v, and V3. And when we do, okay, okay, if we do a V7, V8, V9 lead, which is actually done by placing the leads in the left posterior axillary line at the tip of the left sc uh, scapula and the left spat para paraspinal region, we we'll actually see an ST elevation, the lateral side, okay, which is actually not the lateral, but it's in the posterior wall. And of course, the treatment is the same for all, okay? Antiplatelet, okay? Decisions about thrombolysis or primary PTCA, the duration should be anything less than 12 hours and Anything that can be done within 90 minutes should get anyone that can get an angioplasty done within 90 minutes should have primary PCA. Okay, um, any questions? So let's see, doctor, I'm sorry, may I know when do we do the right sided ECG? So we do the right sided ECG. When we see ST depression in the V1 to V3, and then we don't know whether it is actually an ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI, and we want to prove that it's a serial MI. Um, okay. There is a question that uh, Dr. Tan asked. Hi, good evening. What is your opinion of a young female in the late twenties who have not known to medical, not known to have came into KK with hypercholesterol, about LDL four point six and a HDL of two point three? She also has high platelet distribution. High platelet distribution with what does that mean? Eh? But normal platelets level, normal CRP. I don't know what does high platelet distribution which means. So does it correlate to the high her high LDL? She's concerned about arteriosclerosis formation and the risk of MI. Nisa? I don't think it is. Um, no, I don't case, think it's related. I, I wouldn't categorize her as a hyperlipidemic as well. Um, if you look at the Framingham study, um, the LDL, if you look at its correlation with the HDL cholesterol, um, when the HDL cholesterol is as high as this, 2.23, then 
that LDL of 4.6 probably doesn't carry much risk to this lady. So she probably doesn't have an increased risk uh, as a result of the high LDL cholesterol, actually. Okay, I think uh, there are two things that is in her favor. Uh, one is actually the HDL that is very high. Two is her age. Yeah, of course, three is because she's a still she's a woman with premenopausal. So all these three actually um, are protective um, against atherosclerosis or premature atherosclerosis. Now, would I treat the four point six at the moment? Uh, I think that uh, in this case, um, she can actually be monitored and allowed lifestyle monitoring before we actually start the statin. But as she ages, the HDL level is going to come down. Okay, And I think that then we, and if her uh, LDL still go on at 4.6 or even higher, then definitely I would treat. But in the next few years or so, I think try um, lifestyle modification. Okay, so no article asked, can you really explain how to diagnose a posterior MI based on ECG? Can we go back to the slides again? This is a true posterior MI. It is quite rare. Okay. Uh, and you see an ST depression over v, V1, V2, and V3. Okay. And you don't see any ST elevation anywhere else. Now, you may think that this could be a non-ST elevation MI or a non-Q MI, which you will not be faulted. But because you see some ST elevation here, then if you were to do this, right-sided leads, okay, which you place in V7, V8, and V9. And if you see an active elevation in these leads, then that is how you diagnose posterior MI. Um, I hope that answers your question, Atika. Okay. Tan say I missed out on the fluid challenge part. Can I have a short recap about it? So in a lot of patients with hypotension, okay, um, if they are not in failure and if they present with inferior MI, always think whether you should give a fluid challenge or not. If the lungs are clear, I would give a fluid challenge because right-sided um, infarct is sometimes not uncommonly associated with inferior MI. Okay. And when you have a right-sided infarct, okay, so, okay, let's go through the slides again. Sorry, it's a bit slow. And when you have a right-sided infarct, you have decreased right heart function, which will reduce the LV preload and your cardiac output, and therefore causing systemic hypotension. So a fluid challenge in this kind of cases where there's an absence of heart failure clinically will actually bring up your blood pressure. Okay. Okay. Um, no, Atika asked, can we explain about the component of cardiac rehabilitation? Okay, that's where it fails me. Neither, can you explain cardiac rehab? You basically want to reintroduce activity to the patient we re and take into consideration that uh, the, per the person has just had a myocardial infarction. So with cardiac rehab, you introduce uh, physical activity, um, aerobic physical activity gradually. Um, and uh, this is usually done in stages. Um, there is a structured um, a sort of uh, program um, that most physiotherapy department will have. You know? So um, you can actually refer to, to the physiotherapist for cardiac rehab. 
So Joanne, you say, so only in the absence of heart failure is fluid challenge allowed the right-sided MI. Uh, most times, if you have no fluid in the lungs, yes, then you can try fluid challenge. But if the patient is already overloaded, it okay, means on examination you have crepitations in the lung, I would not add any more fluid. Sometimes um, it, it can be detrimental to the patient. So in an inferior MI, that you can prove that there is possibly right ventricular MI, then I will give fluid. Okay, Tan asks, how do we confirm the diagnosis of familiar hypercholesterolemia other than family history of hyperlipid? Okay, usually it's the LDL level of 4.9 and above with a family history or evidence of, let's say, xanthoma, plasma. And if it is a child, uh, the LDL should be less than, uh, more than 4.5. Uh, yes, you can do genetic testing, but uh, it is not necessary. So um, I will share a slide with you, Tan. Um, I did a chat on, uh, I did a live chat on uh, hypercholesterolemia um, and I will share the slides. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Betty? Yes? I want to ask you, ask, can? Uh, can you comment on uh, acute coronary artery uh, spasm mimicking uh, M -M -M I? Okay. Sometimes, People think that coronary artery spasm is um, actually a benign condition. Uh, but it is um, most times, right, uh, we do not see acute coronary artery spasm as frequently with ECG changes as we like to. So I only have seen coronary artery spasm mostly when I'm doing an angiogram. And they can present quite badly. Okay, it means the blood pressure will drop, the heart rate may drop, okay, the patient may even become unconscious, especially if the LV function is poor. But in the emergency setup, okay, I have not actually seen um, an ST elevation that turned out to be um, spasm. Isa? Yeah, I have not seen I, I, either, actually. But what's interesting is, um, this is, uh, in traditionally, it was called Prince Metal Angina. Yes. You, they present with ST elevation, and then subsequently, the ECG normalizes. And when you do an angiogram, you don't see any lesions at all, you know. Um, more recently, I think that there is something similar um, but they present in something like acute myocardial infarction and they go into heart failure as well. And um, when you actually do an echo on them, you see a very strange phenomenon. The heart is dilated uh, at its base, you know, uh, the Takutsubo um, sort of uh, features. Um, and um, this is also a form of um, uh, what you call vasospasm as well. But uh, what I see most often is actually uh, vasospasm during angiograms. Um, in some people, they are more prone to this. And, uh, uh, and there are probably cases, uh, I, I have a patient uh, that has this. She's a Japanese lady. Um, and she gets angina pectoris as well. And she responds to calcium channel blockers. Um, and she's had this for a long time. So, but you cannot prove it, right? Sorry? Did she have a spasm during the time when you did an angiogram? Yes, she did. Oh, I see. Hmm. Yeah, it can be very dramatic, you know, this vessel spasm, uh, especially in diabetic patients. Okay, um, I had a patient recently uh, with an LV function of 20%. I went to do an angiogram. She actually doesn't have anything. Uh, but I went to... So it nothing much, but I took the last shot and then he went she went to spasm. Okay. 
and she went to the LAD spasm, completely occluded, blood pressure dropped, she became unconscious, we had to give um, epinephrine, we had her on inotropes, and then she was she came back rapidly, especially um, then we have to give atropine. So it can be very, very um, dramatic, and uh, you need to act very quickly, especially if the LV function is poor or when they are diabetic, uh, because they have very poor reserve, you see. Uh, but otherwise, patient presenting with ST elevation MI and ER, um, chances are they're not spasm. Not that I've seen one. Pfizer asked, what's your opinion on EECP therapy? Generally, because we are all interventional cardiologists and we have, I, we don't see a need in EECP. <laughs> I've never used it before. There are probably two indications uh, that I use it for. Um, those patients who have uh, very poor uh, vessels and diffuse disease, uh, and uh, you can't offer bypass surgery or angioplasty. Um, ECP can reduce uh, symptoms. It's been proven to, to, to do so. The other instance is in people with uh, impaired LV function, uh, with poor LV function. You can do ECP and it can actually improve uh, their heart failure uh, because the ECP is just like your IABP. It, uh, if you time the con contraction, with diastole, you get better perfusion and you get a reduction in peripheral vascular resistance. So uh, in that situation, yes. But uh, in preventing heart disease, in curing coronary artery disease, or in treating uh, uh, angina pectoris or people with three vessel disease, um, those are not indicated actually. Um, because um, at all times the ECP will never improve prognosis. It's only for symptoms. Sorry, I'm just typing, um, but uh, I'm asked about the, how do we? Uh, any more last few questions maybe? Yeah, uh, Betty, I just want to share yes? something. Sure. Uh, some time ago, uh, I have one patient uh, diagnosed as uh, acute MI, but eventually it turned out to be uh, herpes, dorsal, on the left. Uh, herpes? Yeah. Okay. Let's check, see. But the patient, when I sent the patient to the hospital, and then he came back and told me that uh, the doctor told him he has uh, MI and given some medication. Then he came and see me huh? later, came and see me later, one week later, because he got blister on the uh, left chest wall. Okay. So he thought that it's due to the side effect of the medication. Then I look at it, it was actually a piece, just a shingle. Okay, so I was wondering, let me... Uh, Unusual. <laughs> I was wondering what happened in the hospital. See? I didn't get any feedback from the... No, um, the doctor really treated the patient as an MI? Yeah, he was given aspirin, given the uh, isodeal, stuff like that, and was told okay. that and was told that he has uh, uh, MI and uh, require uh, angioplasty later. Okay. But the an angiogram was done? Uh, it was not done. So it was okay. and, uh, so and then the, the patient once the patient, I, once I told the patient she has got a pitch roaster, then he said that, uh, can you do an ECG for me now? See whether actually I got the <laughs> MI or not. So I obliged. I did an ECG. There was no kill rate. Normal. No kill rate. Oh, so the, the, the doctor didn't even do an ECG? Did an ECG. Did an ECG. And then said that. Not admitted? Uh, admitted for one or two days. Lah. Okay, so I think uh, maybe possibly your diagnosis is correct. I have had patients coming me see me with chest pain before and turned out to be herpes zoster. So, yeah, it takes a few days to actually for the eruption to start. 
uh, but uh, this is quite interesting. I think not enough investigation was done for the patient determine the diagnosis of an MI in this case. Yes, yeah, so this was about yeah. 30 years ago. Oh, 30 years ago, uh, possibly. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> so, that, I, I, forever I can remember this case. Yeah. Actually, some most times, um, you know, when you learn things through the patient, it's the best way to actually um, remember cases. Okay. Uh, Atika say why... Why we need to know axis deviation right or left in CGs? Um, not that is very helpful most times, but um, sometimes it's uh, interesting in the sense that uh, uh, patients with primary um, like respiratory disorders will probably get right axis deviation. Sometimes it's just um, academic sleep. It, it might it doesn't might actually um, tell you that there might be bifascular blocks actually ah, that's also true uh, and also sometimes um, uh, when you do your treatment for your heart failure does it come in any way that the axis deviation will be helpful in your how you manage your patient? Um, no, but uh, in people with left bundle branch block, yes, obviously we're looking for those people because they usually... But not exist situation, right? In some situation like, um, say, right bundle branch block with the, with the left axis deviation, then you have your anterior fascicle block. Uh, in that situation, some of them might respond uh, to CRTs, actually. So it might help in that sense. Okay. I think uh, we have spoken for almost one hour, 20 minutes. We're going to recap. And um, I think at the end of this session, I hope, one, that you're comfortable in reading ECGs, knowing what is an ST elevation MI, how different an ST elevation MI uh, from anterior to to right-sided chambers, how they can present differently, even though the main problem may be chest pain. Um, but uh, if they have hypertension, how you should be able to then diagnose whether they need a fluid challenge, whether they need inotropes. Um, and the take-home message is how to think while you are in ER and when the patient is admitted, CCU, and then how do you treat them long term? Prevent another episode. I and that is very. Um, if we are done and there's no more questions, then I will see you guys next week with Nisa. We will do um quiz. Okay. Um, Nisa, next week quiz. Okay. <laughs> And then after that, um, in December, so this month we will have two sessions, Nisa and I. Uh, we will see whether we can add another session um, for obstetric uh, emergency. If not, next month we have another speaker. He's actually Dr. Amar Singh, Datuk Dr. Amar Singh. Do you know him personally? He's a pediatric, uh, he was the pediatric head of department in Ipo GH, he has just retired and he's going to speak about how to handle stress as young doctors and then another session is how to read uh, x-rays for, for fractures in neonates. So it should be quite interesting. Nisa, just join us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you guys. Have a nice day or whatever is left of the bed. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. Thank you. Bye-bye.